All right, welcome back to our new weekly member town hall here at Collective Shift. Uh, thanks all members for joining in live as we do every Friday to discuss the market, what's going on with uh, any price sensitive sort of sort of crypto news that's happening. And we also, you know, have time for community so sort of questions as well at the end. So looking forward to getting into it as always. For those watching on YouTube or on the pod or listening on the podcast, uh, for more, to find out more about what we do at Collective Shift, you can always head over to the website at collectiveshift.io. We also have a, a free strategy calls that you can uh, book in through the website as well. Uh, so you can access that through the Become a Member page uh, to, to really, uh, yeah, get a sense of what, what strategies are out there for investors. So, yeah, we'll get into things starting with the week that was. Uh, how are you, Nick? Yeah, awesome, guys. A uh, lot happening this week, actually. Um, the last thing... One or two weeks have been touched quiet relative to the relative crypto mania, but yeah, lot lot to get into. So Bergs, how are you? Going well, mate. Going well. Uh, and uh, we've got some news as well. We had a launch yesterday. So for everyone out there listening to this, we have launched our Collective Shift mobile app, which is awesome. Just so happy to see this out the door and live out in the wild. It is the Android version. We're still waiting on approvals for the iOS version, but that will be along soon. I'll post the link in the chat. Uh, it's across all of our socials. And for all members, download it, put your password in once, and then it's one tap to access absolutely everything. It's fantastic. And then for anyone listening in the public that doesn't have an account, you can still download the app. Uh, it'll put you on a login screen. Just click that Become a Member button, and you'll access the little hamburger menu and be able to access all of our free resources from there. So really happy to put this out there for the community and our members and it's just awesome to have collective shift at, in your hand anywhere you are absolutely brilliant yeah really exciting and looking forward to uh yeah getting that getting that on apple as well uh for us iphone users but yeah i think nick you uh download the the app last yeah, time yeah, yeah i've been using it it's been yeah. good it's been awesome to just check out the content on the go and yeah. Yeah, i know a lot, a lot of people mobile first so keen, keen to get that out and continue to see what's next for the app it's yeah, awesome. Cool. It turned out really well, and it's a full platform just in the app, and it just looks great, and it works. Love it. Good stuff. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll kick things off the week that was. Just a quick update on on the markets. Uh, we have Bitcoin basically down by about about three percent uh, on the week, and ETH was was pretty flat. About didn't really move by much, at least the past seven days. Uh, so yeah, I think Bitcoin is hovering around that twenty three, twenty four thousand. US mark, a uh, US dollar mark. So, yeah, essentially a bit of a, a bit of a relatively flat week, but certainly eventful in terms of in terms of the news that we think might impact the markets. Um, to quickly just just recap macro as well, just to give you a sense of of what's happening uh, in the global economy and monetary policy side of things, which definitely impacts crypto prices. Um, the dates to watch, are, I think, next. I think March 14 is when there is going to be inflation numbers coming out. Uh, so yeah, all very important over in the US. And then March 22nd will be the next sort of monetary policy update. Uh, notably, uh, that is expected to be sort of an increase again of 0.25%. Um, but there is about 30%, the market's sort of pricing in a 30% chance uh, if you refer to the CME FedWatch tool, that is uh, putting in a 30% chance that they're actually going to hike by 50 basis points. So once again, it's sort of this, this narrative of, of higher for longer is sort of the consensus sort of view at the moment. So higher for longer just means interest rates are going to be higher for what we previously expected. Why is that the case? It's because uh, the Federal Reserve, the central bank in the US is really like, finding it hard to sort of bring down inflation. Uh, there's been a lot of signals still coming out, you know, in these recent weeks that, you know, the, the economy is still performing particularly strong in the jobs market as well, in particular. Um, so again, all this is really inflationary sort of drivers that the Fed is a bit concerned about. So, you know, that, that sort of tight monetary environment looks to be sort of going to be continuing for a, a lot longer than we expect, which yeah, absolutely has an impact on risk assets such as crypto. So yeah, it's just an update there. And um, I suppose by the time we chat next week, there might be some more data out and whatnot that uh, we'll really get some more certainty about what's going to be happening 
with the next sort of monetary policy decision. All righty, so I get my screen back up here. Just the um, sort of next major major item uh, that we wanted to discuss this week was probably one of the most most uh, well known and, and most popular sort of altcoins in the market out there, Solana. Yeah, um, we saw Solana yeah. experienced more downtime, unfortunately, uh, which I think a lot of the market was hoping was behind Solana, uh, considering they experienced a ton of well relative to the rest of the cryptocurrency market downtime. So this was, I think, due well, due to an unknown cause, which is kind of concerning that it's been, I think, a week, a week plus now, and I think Solana has not come out publicly and identified what the problem is. Maybe they're aware of it, but they're still working internally, I think, to keep it tight. Uh, but yeah, unknown at this moment, but forced validators to come together to think re restart and sort of rejig the chain out. So people couldn't ac actually access, I think, Solana for a period of time for a couple of hours. And then they experienced, I think, another... 19 hour in total kind of quote unquote outage where they were really unable to really move funds that quickly or at all and yeah we really tough for Solana though because they had really bad bound uh, downtime in 20, 2021 and to the start of 2022 so yeah i'm um, not sure if you're have any updates matt on like where the future is for solana a lot of people probably be worried uh is solana quote unquote dead um is there is this sort of over for solana or you know is should people still be paying attention to it in, in the long run? Yeah, I, yeah, definitely concerning um, for sure. They had sort of made quite a bit of progress since their last sort of major outages. Um, yeah, I still don't think it's, it's dead. Um, but I think as a long-term investment, I would still be keeping my eyes on on Sol, the token, SOL. I still think we, at least the team here at Collective Shift and myself sort of strongly believe that the market sort of uh, punished it like way too hard in late 2022. Uh, you know, yes, it had connections to FTX at the very start of Solana, but really by the time FTX collapsed, like there, the involvement of FTX wasn't really that, that significant. Um, and I think it does have sort of a bigger ecosystem that people sort of give it credit for. Um, but overall, you definitely want to start fixing these, these like tech, these, you know, network performance. Um, yeah, network performance definitely has to improve because yeah, it's really starting to get a pretty bad reputation um, and developers won't want to really build on it if, um, yeah, they won't really want to build on it if they can't really ensure that the chain is going to always be running. Especially because you had li liquidations that when the chain's down, you have people that are hurt financially because they may be traders. And if they have short positions or they have time sensitive trades and they're unable to, you know, close those or edit those for a period of two hours, even if it's for 30 minutes, mm. that's like a really bad UI. It's, it's just a terrible consumer experience for, you know, your, your dedicated users who, who, who want you to use your block space. And, you know, so it's yeah, really, really bad, but I'm kind of hopeful for the long term. And Solana does have a very unique and native way to scale all at once mm. compared to Ethereum, which is going about it in a completely different way. So I see these two different beasts and I still think there's something there with Solana. Yeah, so I'm, I'm sort of in, in the camp too that maybe it's being really harshly done with a lot of negative sentiment that potentially, you know, if it's to stay around, which I think it will, uh, could kind of reap the benefits once. I think these issues are truly behind them. Yeah, that's right. There's that mindset where blockchains just shouldn't go down. They shouldn't have a lot of, you know, centralization. And what are you trading off for speed? And that's a lot of people's kind of view. But at the same time, you know, this is new technology. It's software. You're going to have failures. You're trying something new. It'd be amazing if you just got it right day one. So there's those two kind of conflicting views. And I think Solana has gone down a lot less. So a lot of memes like used to go down kind of quite quite um, frequently. Um, so this one really came out of, the, out of the blue. And it will be really interesting to see... Um, you know, when they do a report on it to see the actual reasons behind it, what went wrong and what they fixed. It might just be a small little thing in Edgy's case that wasn't considered, um, or it may be something significant. So really looking forward to that report. Yeah, for sure. We might drop the link below for people listening on the podcast or members on our on our platform. We'll drop the link to the page that will sort of have the, uh, basically the review or diagnosis of what went wrong once they find it. <laughs> They've got it all set up there, but they still haven't figured out what went wrong. So, Oh, mate, um, like 
those those debriefs you have when there's been like a security event are just a nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully in traditional spaces, like all the the meetings you have, the people who come in, the explaining, you have to do the documentation. It's just like people just want to die. So hopefully it's better in the Web3 space and a bit faster too. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, hopefully. Uh, we'll move on to uh, to Silvergate. Uh, Nick, you explain sort of what's been going on in the past sort of 24 hours. Yeah, so Silvergate, have been, I think it's the most shorted stock in basically at the moment in the market or one of the most and it's kind of leaked a lot of value a lot of issues with it um, that we're sending it lower but then we saw i think core developments overnight actually that happens with coinbase one of the biggest names distancing themselves from silvergate so basically silvergate's one of the biggest on ramps into crypto especially from a uh, institutional perspective and they're sort of you can think of them as the bridge between tradfi and crypto and so a lot of crypto firms will route a lot of financial transactions, a lot of their core infrastructure, a lot of value through Silvergate to help them sort of access an on-ramp into the ecosystem and at the same time, get out of the ecosystem. So they've experienced quite a lot of issues. They've had, um, I think, they're being investigated by a lot of the, I think, US uh, law has actually come after them and like um, asking, I think, the, the Senate to have a look at into, you know, committees into them, to, especially in their relation to FTX. And some of these other cryptocurrencies and now yeah coinbase has distanced themselves i think other names like paxos uh galaxy digital they've distanced themselves so a lot of these big yeah so a lot of these big institutions i think um have just jumped ship from them so sent, sent that i think 50 percent lower in the after trade market so a lot of concerns i think of people around it but maybe you got some insights matt because i know i'm got the feeling that from what i'm seeing in the space is that i think a lot of these institutions were preparing for it not as bad as say an ftx collapse mm. um because maybe they didn't hold actually a lot of their own value themselves um and probably have more i think oversight anyway um into how badly they can be mismanaged um, yeah it was definitely starting to like you know be visibly like a lot weaker and more like vulnerable um you know over the recent months since ftx so yeah i think to your point a lot of these companies would have been already working on different banking relationships i think like circle is another one i think they distanced themselves early mm -hmm. today from from silvergate and then they emphasize that they're already sort of in talks with with other banks um blockchain.com was another one that sort of you know can't like left as a customer um so all these plans would have been in place the real issue or worry, I think the relevancy to like, you know, people listening and stuff, it has this impact the markets. It's really just like, where are these, where are these customers going to go? Like there really isn't too many other options. Um, as we covered recently at Collective Shift in our sort of post on regulatory crackdowns, we sort of highlighted that, um, you know, one or two banks that there was already like six months ago, right? Go back six months ago, there was already a very, very small um group or number of banks in the us that that agreed to service crypto companies uh the major ones like didn't and so really just these smaller sort of ones and sort of in in the moments after the ftx the periods of weeks and months since the ftx collapse there's been like one or two of them have sort of just said like we're not doing any more like servicing crypto companies so it really just left like Silvergate, Signature Bank, I think Silicon Valley Bank, they're like sort of the only three, like three of the only ones left. And it looks like Silvergate is like really on the brink of like just disbanding, like go going insolvent or something. So like my concern and the relevancy for investors is, hey, if there's a massive like, like, well, this debanking trend we've already talked about at length in recent town halls, but if this trend continues and like US-based companies can't really even access banks at all i think that would actually cause prices to to fall in my opinion because the it, the news would start to get out there'd be more companies putting pressure on politicians it would get out in the public of them being like hey we want access to banks this is unfair and it would really just continue this sort of negative sentiment uh i think that crypto is still experiencing you know at least in the headlines in the public so yeah that's my sort of like trying to relate it back to like from an investment standpoint um, we've talked about, yeah, the threat of debanking and, and how that does relate, even though it doesn't relate to the companies that, you know, we work for, like in the US or anything, I think it's still your investment value can definitely be vulnerable if this trend continues. That's right. And that negative sentiment will just shake out those people that are on the fence. 
like when yeah. they like people that are already in the market when they start to hear that and they're like oh regulation is cracking down companies won't be able to get enough capital to survive i'm just going to sell my crypto as well let alone the people that are seeking more capital um, and try to use banking services already in the ecosystem yeah not to forget as well uh silvergate suffered i think a 70 percent drawdown and sort of run of withdrawals so a mm. lot of that withdrawals has already left yeah. Silvergate as well. So they're left with such a low asset base at the moment because a lot of that money's already fled. Mm. So I think you're not going to expect a circumstance where they're not holding customer assets or anything like that because I think they've shown mm. that they're backing you know correctly, not like what FTX happened where they just completely didn't have any backing of the assets and misappropriate customer funds. Mm. So yeah, it's a big one. I know Signature Bank as well. They instituted limits on how much crypto they would hold. Um, mm. certain institutions so yeah i think if we see any more acceleration of this it's it would be pretty concerning to see how you actually get these institutions to on ramp on in and out of crypto which would you know i think would be one of the biggest concerns highlighting the market at the moment yeah and then that on that and also just even these companies just being able to operate you know like so for the retail investors i think it would still impact them because you know if the likes of kraken it's all your exchanges are using these sorts of banking with these companies you know, if they just can't access any bank, that would still impact your know, retail users as well. So it's like in institutional, yes, but also like indirectly retail. So yeah, it's all sort of coming to a head as we've been talking about for, for weeks now. Um, and it's sort of just continuing. And yeah, we'll continue to report on it when it's sort of relevant, particularly in this case, which I think it warranted a bit mm. of a discussion. Yeah, well, maybe we got some other, maybe shifting focus to Ethereum. Uh, we got some news about the withdrawal date so they've always said uh march best case uh maybe april so they've come out and said that um, forget about the march um they're going to you know focus early april uh, and they've set a date for the final and third test net which will go live on march 14. so we got a date for the final test net all goes well with that you'll hear a withdrawal mainnet date uh, and hopefully yeah we can get withdrawals going in early april from all reports from the develop from the developers. Yeah, exciting stuff. I think we got a um, post coming up as well on Collective Shift this month about just uh, the impact that it might have on on the price of ETH. You know, there's there's strong arguments that it'll cause a rally in ETH. There's strong arguments that it'll cause a big sell off. So they're looking forward to sort of you know breaking that down. I know Nick, you've been sort of working on that in the background, and yeah, looking forward to getting mm. that out. Yeah, keen because there'll, there'll be a lot of like headlines. Mm saying how much ETH will be potentially dumped on the market. So it's going to be really, it's really important. I know my own position, we've spoken about this on the podcast is probably maybe non-event to rally, maybe, um, maybe more neutral, just because a lot of this withdrawal stake will be shifted around, I think, and, and, and repurposed back into the Ethereum ecosystem. Uh, and, you know, just switching from different uh, users, um, maybe we're going to see a shift from Lido to these other smaller pools encourage you know greater i guess dis decentralization in the network you know i know kraken will maybe users from kraken will have to withdraw so a lo lot of news there but keen to get that post out and, and and keep a look out on the member platform in the next couple of weeks for that post that's awesome and nick just for some of our listeners can you explain what withdrawals are where the funds currently are and what we're expecting so withdrawals at the moment are sort of locked so um they're in sort of the, the old contracts so Basically, once withdrawals will happen, there's a certain amount, I think it's 1 million or oh, 1 million with ETH, is it? Um, that is automatically withdrawn to, I think, these people. And these are like the rewards that they've been accumulating since they've staked. And at the moment, they just haven't been able to access them. So it will just mean that withdrawals are uh, your rewards that you've earned. And then they'll be able to decide, okay, do I want to repurpose this back into my uh, into the ecosystem, into my staking providers, or do I want to like take that out and then use those funds in DeFi or in the ecosystem, or perhaps um, take tax on those? Because there's obviously sell pressure from like taxable events that will happen, you know, when you're earning rewards via proof of stake. So that's, I think, that the scope of things, um, whether it's we're going to see that exodus, whether you're going to see people repurpose it, or whether you're just going to see people that just stake put and just keep accumulating rewards. It's yeah. all about these partial rewards that they've earned, not so much about the stake that um, is with their validators or their, or their nodes, because you need like a 32 ETH to stake on a yeah. node. Um, I don't know, Rocket Pool are looking at 
potentially lowering those thresholds even more through their sort of system where you can come together to perform a, a node together. That's fantastic. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, and you're spot on, man. This is a known known. We know this event is going to happen. We know how it's going to happen. And they're even going to tell us when it's going to happen, right? And all these people have staked their ETH. They haven't been able to take it out yet. And that event is coming soon. So we'll keep everyone apprised of that. Um, and I'm pretty sure the market will price it in. It's not like this big surprise event that's going to happen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I did say big news. Uh, yeah, throughout the week, that was bullish. So for the gaming space, so I know, you know, crypto gaming is often talked about as, as sort of the next big thing that's going to take us, you know, to the next bull market and, you know, bring in the next wave of users. Uh, I know you, you not spend a bit more time in gaming. So I know this is, involves Unity. So maybe just um, firstly explain, Nick, just break down what, what is Unity and then explain the news that happened. Yeah, so Unity is one of the leading uh, game engines by market share. So they just provide a vital service to games um, and they like help render and perform a lot of these, you know, intensive uh, gaming applications. Um, just sort of like an engine that powers a lot of these uh, games that you play every day. Um, and so this is really important because these are important for crypto games because all these crypto games, especially once you reach um, made different graphics or, you know, different capabilities, you'll be running either through your own game engine or you'd be using a service like Unity who provide that for you. And so what they come out and said is that they're opening a decentralized category in their online store where you can easily access um, and uh, I think um, organize your games. And so this just means that decentralized gaming um, applications or wallets, they'll be able to plug in into Unity and have greater access to their host of tooling, their software, their kit, um, everything to do about that. So it's greater inter integration between the gaming world and crypto, and importantly, one of the biggest uh, game engines that powers many of the crypto games you'll see. This is incredible news. So you could imagine like you're creating a game, you've got your development environment, that's great. And you somehow want to make this Web3 stuff. What do you do? <laughs> you have to go out, investigate packages or make it yourself. It's going to be crazy. Now you can click a couple of buttons. You can integrate. It's going to be fantastic. And now that that's actually built in, people are going to start exploring it and experimenting with it. And I just can't wait to see some results from this. It's going to be amazing. Yeah. So, so like, it's just really important because you're going to see um, Unity and Game uh, web3 developers just be able to easily connect together which is so important and that's a vital cog for I mean, the gaming ecosystem to take that next level once you have all these tooling available and it's so much easier so yeah they supported around 13 different uh blockchain ecosystem developer kits uh so anywhere from flow to ethereum to immutable x to solana um, even to smaller ones such as um algorand and aptos so they're really um being um neutral in terms of who they're supporting. And they're just saying, hey, if you want to create crypto games and Web3 games, you know, we're making it easy for you guys to, to build on Unity and you know, with the one largest game engine there is. So we're really keen for this announcement. Yeah, no, it's like really, really exciting for sure. Um, and <laughs> I, think I think it's like a real it, bear market validation. as well. Like, yeah, yeah, for it to happen in a bear yeah. market too, like after all the pain <laughs> crypto has been through, um, to still see them you know, confident enough to do this is up. Uh, Really, yeah, a, a nice endorsement. And I just just to wrap up this sort of topic, I saw MetaMask was like involved in this announcement. What sort of like what is their involvement? Or... So I think it's like to do with like MetaMask's own developer kits in their wallets, and I think performing better integration with a lot of these game engines and a lot of these games themselves. And so I think MetaMask are rumored oh. to be entering the gaming space in a big way. So I'm really keen to see what MetaMask are going to be cooking up and what they're developing. I feel like we're going to see an absolute onslaught of innovation from MetaMask that may be coming. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm really keen to see what's going on there because biggest wallet in the space. They've sort of, I've been, a, I've been harsh on them for being such a terrible <laughs> UI experience. It was so outdated that we need better, better wallets in the space. So hopefully we're going to see MetaMask continue to develop and yeah, um, start supporting these Web3 games. That's it. This is incredible. And just an analogy I was thinking of, this is like having a share button on your phone. Like before you had that button to actually send things across and integrate and do all this, like, you know, to your friends it was 
stupid. Like it was so hard to do. And now you just press like share button, you tick the little things and away you go. And if you can now focus on creating your game and then you say, great, I want microtransactions and you just pull in like the little MetaMask piece or you pull in the next piece and you can integrate with these different blockchains, that's going to be absolutely game changing. Like the speed of innovation is just going to 10x. It's going to be amazing. Yeah, but great to great to follow. Yeah, the process of this and even maybe more announcements uh, from MetaMask. I think you know just uh, yeah wrapping this up. I think account abstract abstraction is something we've sort of talked a mm -hmm. bit about, and I think account abstraction is probably going to be you know a bit of a hot topic coming in maybe like later twenty twenty three, maybe like twenty twenty four. Just in the overall crypto space, I think every blockchain sort of is pursuing it. Some of them already have it. Um, and I know like Starkware is like one example and. Just in this in this example, like with MetaMask, like currently without account abstraction, if I'm understanding correctly, if you want to go perform something on a game, you'd have to basically like approve your move like every time. Wouldn't mm. you? Like if, if yeah. it was with a wallet and it was connected to the blockchain, if you wanted to go attack Nick with a sword or something, you'd have to like sign MetaMask to like do that. And then <laughs> and then Nick replies with another attack and then approves on MetaMask. Whereas something like StarkNet. From my understanding, it just basically you sign it once and it yeah. tracks it away, and we can just keep fighting each other. Yeah. So at a high level, like account abstraction sounds like another confusing term in the crypto ecosystem, but it just means that it's a better user experience because it starts to separate out your wallets into different accounts. So uh, if even if you sign a malicious transaction, it looks like say in a game that you've given approval for, it means that your other account that is still tied to that same wallet may be safe and segregated. Right. So it's sort of separating your accounts out, you know, segregating, abstracting your accounts in different ways. So it provides different experiences. So if you have another game, you may be able to get a set of approvals for that game. And it's just a better experience because you'd be able to just like, yeah, um, click once and then sort of play forever in, in, that, in that regard. Yeah. That's fantastic. And that's the way it needs to be. Because like, yeah. look, if you two want to get a fight on, you're not going to stop every two seconds and go, hang on, mate, <laughs> just got to prove this, got to wait for gas, got to wait for the transaction to go through. It's like, no, just do it once, send it away. And then at some later date, we can settle and it won't affect my other funds. That's the absolute perfect way to do it. Yeah, it's good to be trading that way. I know even Vitalik, uh, you know, founder of Ethereum, he sort of wrote a blog post like a few days ago, just sort of you know, really, I'm not being critical. I just sort of like emphasizing like how poor the user experience still is. Like he obviously knows it's like extremely hard. He wasn't really being critical, but he was just highlighting how much work there is left to do. It's like a kind of distraction will sort of be that that move towards, you know, really consumer apps. User experience is going to be real focus the next few years. Yeah, I'm keen for this. Yeah, that, I'm just keen for the idea of abstraction of blockchain away anyway. So mm. I think we're on that trend. Um, we're even seeing games or apps uh, being developed when you're not mentioning blockchain mm. nfts you're not mentioning these actual like buzzwords and confusing terms that are tough yeah. for the end user for sure for sure um yeah so we'll watch this space um there was a bit of an update with uh in over in over in england that i know you'd want to just touch on nick maybe just as an example of you know what is decentralized what is decentralized and what isn't i think yeah, so this was an interesting topic that came out this week because we saw Wormhole, which got uh, exploited for $320 million, one of the biggest hacks ever, back in February 2022. They were forced by a court order by the Court of Wales and England, I think, to perform any action necessary to recover those funds back. So what actually happened was a court ordered a DeFi application to upgrade a contract so that Jump Crypto, who was the creator or the backer of Wormhole, to counter exploit the you know the hacker and get the money back. So this is really interesting in terms of where we're looking at um, DeFi, where you draw the line in decentralization and like if this is okay or like I think we're going to see a lot more of this, which is hopefully we can see a push towards decentralization and like. Um, but it's an interesting one because you know whenever you have a court order ordering a DeFi application to use a multi-sig to upgrade a contract to steal a user's fund or not steal it, but um, take it away in a very crafty manner. You know, it raises a lot of eyebrows. Um, so a lot of people were very critical of it this week. Um, the app in question is Oasis, which is heavily tied to Maker and MakerDAO. Mm. Yeah, I think Oasis was one. It was basically like the first product MakerDAO sort of launched like after they released 
their die uh, multi collateral die then i think they released oasis which was sort of like a, an exchange um so yeah it's like we hear so much about consultation reviews with regulation things like that that aren't binding so it's like yeah, we are still talking about this just because it's it's actually something that did happen this week that was an order from the yeah. court. It just gives you a bit more insight into, you know, how, how these might evolve like in the years to come with respect to, you know, where you draw the line, as you said. Especially when we see all these multi-sigs that are out there. Um, I know Chainlink's one that a lot of people have been controversial about. Um, a lot of these Ethereum solutions, they're still under a multi-sig. I know a certain majority of them are a lot more applications are still behind the multi-sig. They're not properly decentralized. Um, and if, they, if a court order wanted, they could maybe pressure these teams to question like a lot of these blockchain principles. So one thing that I wanted to just quickly finish on is um, this example, maybe it's not as, maybe not as bad as it seems just because it's um, not, uh, people may be confused that it's immutability is gone and like they just reverse the blockchain which didn't happen explicitly. You know, um, Oasis uh, had a contract that could be changed basically and upgraded by the team. So this was a very niche case specific to this application, which, you know, wasn't properly decentralized. Um, so yeah, key distinction there and people thinking, oh no, the you know, blockchain can be reversed. And I know I saw a few comments like that during the week, uh, okay. uh, which is just not true. Um, and it all just comes down to, unfortunately, this user made a bad decision and put their exploited funds on a contract that could be upgraded arbitrarily by a core team, you know, who then used that ability to upgrade a contract and then a very crafty team able to exploit them back. So not yeah. a case of like, you know, blockchain can be upgraded, um, can be changed, can be fudged. Um, just a very a niche yeah. example, but one that still is pretty relevant in terms of court courts ordering decentralized applications to or any other crypto firm to upgrade contracts mm, um, yeah. you know, at, in a legal capacity. And this is where we see how decentralized you really are. So yeah. multi-sig just means you need two or more signatures in order to perform an action. And let's say there's 10 people and you know who those 10 people are. Well, you're not really that decentralized. You can go after them, <laughs> right? And it's like having, you know, 10 keys to open a safe and you need all 10, you can compel those people and then they'll have to go and do the action or face the consequences. And again, those if those people all spread out over the world, that's better. If they're in one location, not so great under the same jurisdiction. Or if there's 10,000 people, then you're not really going to do it, are you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's a good distinction. And yeah, might see more examples of this uh, Yeah, in the coming months and, and whatnot. Um, yeah, finishing off sort of uh, before we get to the member questions and for members watching, do um, make sure to put in some uh, put in some questions in the chat. Uh, we'll, we'll look forward to getting to them soon. Uh, but yeah, Binance um, yeah, just continues to be attracting sort of, you know, negative headlines, whether they're true or not. Uh, maybe just talk, yeah, break down sort of what's been happening uh, Nick, with, with Binance. Yeah, Binance has continually been in the heat because regulators have come for their stablecoin. So we saw their BUSD stablecoin start to dwindle in market share just because Paxos has stopped issuing it. Uh, they're being investigated, you know, on numerous fronts from 2017 uh, allegations of like money laundering and sort of shady business that they were doing in the early days. And now we're seeing more rumors face them in terms of what they're doing with customer funds. I think Forbes come out with a really interesting article. We basically alleged that they were commingling user funds in a way FTX did. Uh, so they didn't come out with any like hard, hard evidence of what they did with the funds, just saying that potentially user funds have been uh, not properly segregated. So normally in best practice, you would want to separate. I think what like Coinbase does is they have customer funds and they're totally separate, separate accounts. Whereas what, People with looking on chain is that potentially Binance have been putting a lot of customer funds, a lot of uh, Binance investment funds, a lot of Binance own internal funds into similar contracts. And then they're pulling them out and using them for different things or moving them from different areas. Um, yeah. Tough one here because I think maybe we do have PTSD from FTX collapse. Um, I know I'm probably maybe more bearish or concerned about this just because I see really really bad similarities between the way I think CZ is acting and the way maybe Sam was and sort of this nature of an opaque um, offshore exchange that 
you just don't really know what their financials are and what they're doing, um, uh, you know, mm. um, un- undercover there. Yeah. So that's just the part that concerns me is that you just don't know and you have to trust that Binance is doing the right thing. And there's even rumors that they don't even have a, a CFO. I'm not sure if that's 100% true, but there have been allegations that they don't actually have proper management similar to what I was seeing with FTX. Yeah. Maybe not to the same degree, but yeah. I think high level here is, you know, as always, you know, your funds are best saved with you. Um, keeping any substantial amount on an exchange anyway is tough, even if they're like super, super reg- um, highly audited. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what your yeah. thoughts are there, Matt. Like, it's a thing just to watch. Um, yeah. It could, it could be more information come out, uh, potentially even good good news, maybe if they settle with um, law enforcement and sort of come to an agreement, maybe that's good for confidence in the market. Yeah, no, I think... Um... I think we were talking with Checkmate, like who, you know, an uh, on-chain analyst who does sort of, you know, Bitcoin, mostly about Bitcoin, you know, on-chain posts for our members multiple times a week. I think he joined us in a town hall late last year. And I recall him saying, you know, the Alameda or FTX sort of wallet management was just like an absolute shit show, essentially. Mm-hmm. Like they, it was just like so hard to track. And because he does a lot of like tracking of exchanges for, for yeah. his job. Uh, and I remember him saying that Binance was like surprised. I was surprised to mm. hear him say that Binance was actually like one of the easier ones to sort of get in the weeds of like of their on-chain data and whatnot, which like which was at least a bit a bit like encouraging for me. But definitely these ties to like the early stages of Binance and even as they founded this this Binance US entity, you know, there's been just a lot of just yeah reports. As you said, like Binance is refuting all of that, but how much can you trust it? But of course, they're going to refute it. So again, um, I think I did say in a report for members this week that if I had to pick like one factor that is like the biggest like overhang on the crypto market at the moment, I would like absolutely say it's Binance. Like that's the, it's the area of like largest sort of like uncertainty risk and the market hates uncertainty. So to your point, Nick, there's been like rumors going around for a few weeks now that Binance is on the verge of like settling with the SEC um, over things to do with like unregistered securities and whatnot. Um, depending on the nature of this settlement, assuming it does come out, um, you know, if, if, if it kind of just like absolves them from like a lot of other allegations and whatnot, and they like pay, you know, what's rumored to be like a record um, penalty, um it yeah it could actually remove a lot of uncertainty from the market um again it really just depends on the nature of this of this settlement but yeah it's it's hard to really like talk too much about because we just don't know it's but so it's tough. more just like yeah. it's just important for everyone to understand that it's just like a really really big overhang on the prices of crypto at the moment. that was a good um that was a good identification though of like perhaps why it's not such a good analogy comparing the the two together because FTX had no public uh, wallets on the blockchain. That was one of the biggest red flags. I think everybody learned and kicked themselves for, you know, for not really realizing that that was the biggest red flag they had. No one could actually find their on-chain, you know, funds. Uh, Binance has many different wallet addresses public that they've declared, I think more than 10 to 20. So we can see that there are substantial amounts of funds there. Ultimately, you just don't know what the liabilities are. Yeah. Yeah, well said. Um, so we'll continue to see what happens. But um, yeah, I think we will we will wrap things up there for our, for our listeners on the podcast and those watching on YouTube. Thanks for joining us uh, this week. And to learn more about what we do at Collective Shift, definitely go over to the website at collectiveshift.io. And yeah, we'll have plenty more content coming out in in the weeks to come, days to come. So yeah, thanks for joining us. Thanks everyone. See ya.